All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Restuccia, your host, and uh, today we're going to be talking about, gosh, something that's been uh, in the news a lot this week, and that has been uh, water challenges in the West. You know, the West, we saw two significant news pieces this week about water in the West, and it's going to, uh, it, well, it's been a tough year. Uh, it's really uh, the 22nd year, I feel, of a mega drought in the West. It seems to be getting worse, and uh, there's not much uh, let up in sight. Uh, so I wanted to bring on our guest today, Jeff Toole, the Executive Vice President of Jane Irrigation, and more importantly, uh, somebody who's a thought leader when it comes to technology and water conservation and water management in the field of agriculture to talk about this, right? Because you know, when I think about how much water is used in California for agriculture, 30 million uh, acre feet a year thereabouts uh, versus about 6 million acre feet for urban use. Uh, but I mostly see people talking about, well, we got to cut back our urban water use, take out your lawn, water your lawn. I don't think it matters. I think we could reduce it to zero and we still wouldn't hit our targets. So I think really agriculture, you know, is is uh, has been hit. Uh, it's going to be hit more. Uh, it's the place where we can make up the biggest difference in the shortest period of time. Jeff's got a ton of experience about on this, and uh, I wanted him to uh, share that experience with us. He works with growers every day in the Central Valley of uh, California, and uh, really has some great insight for us. So uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate you uh, being on. Oh, Richard, as always, thank you for a great introduction and always glad to be here. You know, I really enjoy your and I's exchanges. I think, you know, today is a pretty hot topic and, um, you know, we may touch on some sensitive things. And I know even, you know, with the comparison between, you know, what we're doing in ag, you know, versus, say, the urban side of things, um, I think it, it should be an exciting meeting today. Yeah, I do too, Jeff. And I, I just want to be clear too. I think we do have to conserve everywhere, but uh, I'm always looking for where we can make uh, some of the biggest gains. And uh, and we've got a lot of concert. Uh, uh, we've got a lot of conserving to do. So uh, so I think that's key. So Jeff, uh, you know, you lived in the Central Valley for a long time now. You've been involved in agriculture there for a long time. Um, how, how bad's the drought getting right now? How how bad is it for growers? Can you kind of put that in perspective for us? You know, it's uh, it, we're, I really feel like we're at a tipping point, you know, for California growers, as well as not just California, but the, throughout the whole Western uh, U.S. This uh, the mega drought we're in, um, it's been going on since I think it started around uh, two, 2000, something like that. They've been off and on different years, but you know, they look at it over that period of time and it's really, it really is a dire situation and, and I think you know what you're saying is we're we're all responsible as as stewards of the land you know as those that put uh, food on many tables many tables and then those of us that provide irrigation and ag technology um, you know we all can do our part to create a more sustainable future so it's a big problem requiring big solutions yeah, it's interesting too, Jeff, because um, one thing I really have felt for many years is that uh, we tend to take water for granted, right? Turn the tap on. Every time I've turned the tap on, and I'm not just good at it, I mean, it's just the way it is, water comes out. Yeah. I've been to other countries where that isn't the, the case. Yeah. I know when I ask people, gee, where does your water come from? They're never very sure. And uh, two, how much does it cost? And they say, I don't know. Now they're saying it's expensive, but they don't really know the cost of where it comes from. Two real basics. Now, I mention this because I think you personally at uh, your place there are having a little bit of a challenge, right? You're on a well, is that right? That's right. It's, um, it's become very personal to me. I was thinking about it before today's webinar. And, you know, uh, my wife and I moved uh, out to some property we're on the well. Uh, first time my wife has ever been on a well. So, you know, what you said is it, very true. When, when our when we started having problems, our pump, you know, started cavitating and our well is, is 
is not running dry. It's just not deep enough. You know, we're sitting at about 100 feet and our pump is sitting at probably about 85, 87 feet, which is right where the water line is in, in our area. So we have been limping and I, I, I don't know, I would describe this literally as water anxiety. You know, here I've been in, I've been in this industry for a long time and I've helped you know, a lot of growers, you know, sold and installed a lot of drip irrigation systems. You know, we're always trying to help growers be as efficient as possible with ag technology. And literally for the first time in my life, um, you know, we're, I have a five gallon bucket in my shower that, you know, I run the water in until it gets warm so that I can then go out and put that five gallon bucket on my plants because we we've, we've had to let our entire lawn die. So I have this, you know, nice property with brown grass in front of it to try to keep the trees that we have alive on the property. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a personal issue for me today. Yeah, so right, this is the type of thing we think about, you know, when I take my trips to the Dominican Republic, we think of that happening there, right? Not, right. Uh, not mm -hmm. uh, just outside of Fresno, California. Right. Um, so then I wanted to ask you too, your, your current well is how deep? Uh, at the hundred feet. Okay. And uh, so you mentioned the pump was at 87 or so, and then how deep, uh, so you've got somebody coming in to drill a well. I do, you know, we've been on the waiting list, which is that that's what's created this anxiety. All of the well dr drillers in the area, you know, ag wells and domestic are booked out for a year. When we first started making calls, they were like, hey, we're probably not gonna be able to get to you in a year unless you run out. And then we literally started running out. So, you know, thankfully we got moved up um, on the priority list and next week is when they're supposed to start to start drilling. And they'll go for, they're gonna shoot for 300 to 350 feet. Yeah, so uh, pretty deep in comparison. Right. And um, Jeff, I'm sorry to say, anytime I hear I'm on a waiting list to have, uh, labor done yeah. i know it's not cheap right yeah so yeah they're not giving wells away i think you know it's probably going to cost all in right thirty thousand dollars yeah so the, this is a issue you're facing yeah. many more are going to be facing and uh certainly it seems to be getting worse not better Absolutely. and um you know as i mentioned we saw the um <clears throat> colorado river levels and lake mead and lake powell are in desperate situation, right, where we saw the tier two go into effect for the Colorado River this week, which um, really means, uh, in particular for the state of Arizona, uh, my uh, my home state, 21% uh, less uh, water draw uh, next year from the Colorado, which is going to impact uh, both uh, urban and, uh, and agriculture. And uh, some other states have to make some cutbacks. California doesn't have to cut back yet, but uh, they need a 15% reduction or they'll be forced in 2023 to cut back. So these are some of the numbers that are being thrown at us. These are numbers we hadn't ever seen before in the history of uh, drawing water out of the Colorado. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think you have some slides too that kind of point out uh, how bad this situation is. Let me, uh, did my, I see, did this change, uh, did I change slides? There we go. There we go minor technical difficulty here so these are these are some of the headlines um that i picked up on from the these are these are recent just from the last days and few few weeks from some of the various scientific and news organizations so when you look at the top here park park williams i read this this study really interesting you know it, it piqued my interest when i saw the the 1200 years and he actually did uh tree ring studies to go back uh, looking at the severity of, of droughts um, to 800 AD. There's, there's trees in the area, um, you know, that are very, very old. And, you know, through some of the, the modern technology, they're able to look at the size of the rings and, and you can gauge um, how much water was available to the tree, you know, during these, these periods. And, you know, his findings, he said, the last notable uh, drought that was even close uh, to this one was in the late 1500s. Wow. And um, it's, it's so, so you have to think about that. It's really the, the driest stretch, the, the 2000, he's saying the 2000 
to 2018 period is the driest um, stretch since the 1500s. And that's yeah. significant. It is. It's interesting, too, because, um, you know, you're going to mention uh, bullet two here, the Colorado yeah. uh, River Tier 2 shortage. Absolutely. Which is really um, a, a double uh, a double issue, right? right? They formed this uh, law of the river yeah. uh, about 100 years ago now. Right. When there was a lot more flow in the river. So we had more flow. And at the same time now, a lot more people uh, in the West than we had 100. So, so it's a, a, a dual uh, issue. So to compare it even back, you know, 1,200 years, yeah, know, nobody totally. here. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and I mean, with this tier two um, being invoked, Arizona um, kind of get the short end of the stick on some of those negotiations. And, you know, actually some of the negotiations that occurred in the 80s when Arizona was building the uh, Central Arizona project. And, you know, that wasn't completed until in the um, early 90s. And I was actually living in Tucson at the time. And I remember, you know, when the CAP project, you know, was getting finalized and, you know, people were, it was really to get uh, Tucson off of groundwater. And um, it's a big deal, but, but Arizona's looking at a 21% cut in 2023 and Nevada's going to have an 8% cut. And then Mexico's going to have some cuts as well. Because of the negotiations that went on in the 80s, California is still going to get 100% of its allocation. Um, basically, California was able to negotiate. They were fighting this CAP project and Arizona gave in, if you will, and said, okay, California gets the priority above the uh, CAP um, users. So. Yeah, it's interesting that you should mention that too, right? 1990 is the year I left Arizona and I lived in uh, Maricopa County. That's the county that Phoenix is in. Right. And at the time, now today, there's more people in just Maricopa County than there was in the entire state when I left. Yeah. So they, in the last 30 years, they have had the growth. Uh, I mean, they've had a lot of people move there. Right. And it's also, right, put an extra strain on their water system that I don't think they saw in the, in the um, 90s when they made that agreement. Absolutely. Who, who could see that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I think we have to be careful. I mean, I want to give the impression that California is out of the out of the woods on this. I mean, if, if Lake Mead continues to to drop, then California will see um, cutbacks, you know, of its allocation from the Colorado River as, as well, even though, you know, we have these higher priority rights. There is a threshold at which and it's not that far, um, you know, much further down that uh, California will start seeing some cuts as well. Yeah, I think it's actually we need to uh, reduce 15% this year or we'll be uh, uh, forced uh, to reductions next year. Yep, totally. And then, you know, Governor, Governor Newsom started talking about uh, building not, not two, but one Delta tunnel to, uh, to increase the pumping and conveyance uh, capacity when the Delta is at higher levels during, say, heavy rain or heavy snow melt. And, you know, I hate to say it. I mean, I'm not a not a huge, you know, Newsom fan, but it's a day late and a dollar short. You know, what's interesting to me is that, you know, he's taking all this political credit, you know, for for talking about this and trying to get this going. But the experts are saying that in order to build the tunnel, it's going to take 20 years, you know, for that tunnel to be completed and fully functional and actually actually helping, uh, you know, us here in the valley. So you know, it's just another one of those uh, kind of political situations where, you know, we wait until it's it's critical. Um, and this should have been done a long, long time ago. You know, Jeff, it's interesting, right, that we do uh, somehow uh, a lot of this uh, conservation has become um, uh, politicized. Yes. And I think about 10 years ago when the state passed Prop 13, and there was a five-year period in which they waited to put it on the ballot because finally by 2012, the drought was bad enough that they figured people would vote for the Prop 13 to increase um, catchment, uh, mainly catchment uh, in, in the state of water, of rainwater. And, mm -hmm. uh, but they had to wait because 
what this meant was an additional 40 bucks a person in taxes. And people don't want to pay more taxes. But so then I, I come back to so a couple things, right? One thing I really like that I, you know, this week you probably saw uh, there's been a lot of talk about a water infrastructure across the United States. Why aren't we pumping water from the Mississippi River to California right. or into at least Lake Powell and Lake Mead? Yeah. And um, uh, well, it'll take a long time. It's really expensive. And you know, you want to manage what you're responsible for managing. And that, that was the message we got from California. We're going to manage the water we have better yep. and figure that out. And then I even think about personal responsibility to a person, right? We had Lance Sweeney on uh, Irrigation Architect last year talking about capture all the rainwater on your property and store that. Don't let it get to uh, the sewers or the drains or for me back in the ocean. Catch yep. it on your property. Keep it there. Yep. and uh, properly filter it and use it. Right. And um, so I, I, I like where you're going with this, right? That it's uh, really up to us personally to, uh, to, to make a difference here. Yeah, yeah. everybody's got to make a difference here. You know, the last bullet point on here, it kind of blew my mind. I heard it on the radio um, actually uh, late last week. And, you know, I, I did my own double take here because they started talking about, you know, a mega flood. And so I, you know, I, I went and I, I researched this and, um, you know, the models and these models they found to be, you know, I think fairly reliable at predicting possible outcomes and the probabilities are, are quite significant at this point, mainly driven by the fact that our average temperature in the West has gone up by two and a half degrees Fahrenheit, you know, on average. And so what that really means is that, you know, when we have these atmospheric river uh, storms in the wintertime, they, they generate uh, normally a ton of snow and that snowpack is really becomes our life's blood, uh, you know, during the spring and, and summer months as that melts. And they're saying, you know, because of the, this increase in average temperature, that snow line is going to be at much higher elevations. And a lot of what normally would have fallen as snow is now going to fall as rain. Um, and yeah, you know, we all know where most of that runoff goes when we have, you know, the, the, these flooding or these atmospheric river conditions goes to the ocean, but, you know, we could see some benefits in terms of, you know, some groundwater recharge, you know, maybe some large filling events, uh, for some of the lakes and reservoirs that, you know, we'll talk about in, in just a minute, but it just is, to me, it just points to where we're at right now. With these two dichotomies of talking about um, historic flood potential, you know, when we're in the middle of a mega drought, uh, it, it just really, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, when I said dire at the beginning, I meant dire. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting. I saw some other, um, some videos this week talking about how much harder it is for water to percolate soil that's been through a drought than if it receives consistent uh, moisture. So right, right. this, um, I, I did the same thing. I did the double take when I saw that headline. But then after I started thinking about it more, gee, it makes a lot of sense, right? And 10 inches of snow equals one inch of rain. You think about the 100 inches uh, in, in the mountains around Fresno there, but uh, a lot of it falling is rain. Instead of snow, you don't get that melt, right? Which is the regulation of water. Exactly. And, uh, and then you've got some hard packed soil. Uh, yeah, you can see the big problem coming. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's the article is really interesting. I mean, if, if people uh, are intrigued by that type of information, you know, if you read uh, these studies, it's it's very plausible. I mean, it, it's I think what we're seeing there is very plausible. And I've got a couple, I've got a couple of interesting uh, slides here. Um, I know you you liked this one. It's a GIF. It came from the Na NASA Earth Observatory. This is Lake Mead. And these are satellite images from 2000 versus uh, 2022. Um, and, you know, the current level of, of Lake Mead is about 1,044 feet, which is the lowest it's been since it was filled back in the 30s. And I just, this image, this little GIF here, to me was uh, fairly profound in terms of showing just how much Lake Mead is down. It's, uh, it's pretty shocking. It's kind of mesmerizing too, but what really uh, jumps out at me is um, 
the length in which the lake was, right? You can really right. see that in the in the three arms there and right. how much that is down. Wow. Yeah. I think you have one of um I do. Lake Powell as well. That's even more concerning. Exactly. I wow. Mean, lake Powell <laughs> looks like it's darn near dried up. I mean, part of the lake, you know, looks like it's now, you know, a small stream or a small river. Yeah. And it's only, I mean, right now, Lake Powell is about 32% of its capacity. Um, so, you know, huge, huge drawdown of, of Lake Powell. And I've got one here also of uh, Shasta, which is the largest uh, reservoir um, in California. And you can see here, the last time Shasta was at full pool was in uh, 2019. And it's now at um, it's now at 38 percent, and it's actually it's actually in better shape in 2022 than it was in 2021. It was it was down further last year, and this uh, Shasta is, is predominantly filled by rain. So, you know what I was reading about you know the hydrology of the lake. You know some of these um, atmospheric rivers that we're talking about. Um, that type of event can fill Shasta quickly. Um, there's a lot of inpouring um, into into Shasta from runoff, and um, so it is a lake that can re replenish itself um, if we do get the rain. So Jeff, did I hear you correctly? In 2019, it was full. Yeah, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, and 38 percent today. That right. Yeah. So the others were over 20 plus years. This is just over a few uh, few years. Right. Wow. It's not yeah. as dramatic down, but the right. fact that it's it uh, uh, lost 62 percent in just a few years is uh, really pretty shocking. And it is significantly smaller. I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it is significantly uh, smaller than, than the other two lakes uh, in this area. All right. Well, I think uh, I think we understand fairly well the challenges uh, that, that we're facing and you know, the bottom line is there's less water available and, and that means both, you know, what we've talked about today, both surface and groundwater. Um, there's regulations and restrictions, you know, Sigma here in California being one and there, there are restrictions across the board, you know, Richard on your side, you know, on the urban side. Um, you know, heavy restrictions, uh, Nevada, Arizona, um, is having some significant uh, cut cutbacks as well. And, and so I think we understand the problem fairly well. So I wanted to start talking a little bit about um, what, what can we do? What are some of the solutions? Um, what are some of the things that we can change that are, you know, more in our control? And uh, flood, flood irrigation, it's always been, you know, the whole flood versus pressurized irrigation has been uh, hotly debated uh, for a, a long time. But, you know, most everybody that I talk to these days, both, um, you know, in the industry uh, and, and out, I think it's fairly well accepted that, you know, pressurized irrigation is more efficient than, uh, than flood irrigation. And, you know, it's mainly, when you think about it, it's mainly due to um, you know, improved evaporation losses, improved, uh, you know, deep percolation, um, where you're losing water that's going, you know, down below the, the root zone. You, you do get some benefit for, for groundwater recharge on that. And then another huge one is, is just runoff, um, you know, from flood irrigated um, fields. And you can see from this chart, we've really made a lot of progress over the last uh, 30 years. You know, we've gone from 37% in 1984 uh, to 72% in 2018. That was the last statistics taken um, for irrigated crop land using some form of pressurized irrigation. And, you know, I think what's, what's troublesome is we still have over 12 million acres of, of gravity, you know, or flood irrigated fields in the Western U.S., you know, according to the statistics here. Yeah, this is just uh, mind boggling to me, right? Because, you know, where, where I live in San Diego, the, uh, the water authority is paying four bucks a square foot to take out your lawn. 
So 170 some thousand dollars an acre to take out your lawn. Yet I just heard, you know, 30% of the farmland still flood irrigating. And uh, so that, 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 right, that makes my head spin. But, you know, as we've talked about this, I, I, I guess there's some good reasons why they still are, but, uh, but it's frustrating, right? Because um, we're all feeling guilty that we're doing urban irrigation at all. Right. right? That, like the whole onus of solving the drought is on me and my neighbors. <laughs> and we're never going to make it if that's the case. Right. And then when you hear this number, it's, it's almost discouraging. It makes you feel like, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and water my turf. Right. Yeah. No, no, for sure. And I, I definitely, I definitely get that. I think, you know, I think on the ag side of, of the irrigation industry and, and the ag industry as a whole, I mean, you know, there's always this, this debate, you know, we, we got to eat, right? So we got to have food on the table. And, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, flood and what I think on flood and, you know, it'd be interesting to, to hear if we've got any other, you know, comments on it. Um, but, you know, before I go into the bullet points here, I, I wanted, I wanted to make somewhat of an unpopular but true statement. And, and that is the optics of flood irrigation to the non farming public is so poor. And I believe it helps foster, you know, the notion that farmers are wasting too much water. It's it's one of the first things that people that don't farm uh, bring up. I mean, you know, people know that I'm in the ag irrigation business and, and there are times, you know, where I might get um, somewhat lambasted or get a lot of questions about, oh, I drove by these fields and they were all flooded. You guys just waste water, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, we can all debate the pros and cons. But there's no denying that it looks wasteful. It, it does, Jeff. And I think that's so important because we all know that we look to other people in society. We look at our peers and we say, what are they doing? And for example, if we think people are cheating on their taxes, we're more prone to cheat on our taxes, right? Because we don't want to be yeah. the, the, the person who's right. This is this is. Yeah. Right. And people who cheat on tests or whatever, if they think other people are cheating, well, they want to keep up. So right, right. people do look at this as a measure Absolutely. of uh, of what they should be doing. Yep. I, I, I totally agree. And I think it's just one of those things that's kind of a low hanging fruit, you know, for us as an industry. And I, and I think also, and this is probably as much on, on you and I, you know, maybe we need to do a better job of you know, publishing that we've gone from 37% to 72%, you know, pressurized irrigation, and there's been tremendous uh, amount of effort put in by growers over the last 30 years to to irrigate as efficiently as, efficiently as possible. And yeah, there is still a, a lot of, of drip out there. Um, I'm sorry, a lot of flood out there. But, you know, you can't, it's hard to blame the grower. And it's kind of goes to the first point here, you know, when I when I've talked to growers and asked the question, you know, why are you still using your flood systems? And, you know, the response is, is that it's it's their cheapest source of water. And and many times um, the allocations come from their water district and it's it's a take it or lose it, um, you know, scenario. So, you know, if I've got a flood system out there, even if I have a dual system, there's a lot of growers that have dual uh, flood and drip. And, um, you know, when they get that district water, why not take it? I'm just going to go ahead and, and flood the field and then I won't run my drip for a couple of weeks. And, and because it is the cheapest and, and growers, growers are good business people. I mean, they have to be, you know, look at the challenges, um, look at everything, you know, from inflation to weather, uh, bugs. I mean, you name it, the growers are, are facing it and, and they, they have to make a dollar. Um, they have to survive. So you can't blame growers for making, um, I'll say the most cost effective decision, you know, when it comes to you know, running their, their flood irrigation. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, they're good business people. They're trying to run a business uh, for profit. Yep. And um, a lot of times it is a matter of policy, right? Right, or like you said the other day, 
you've got your water for the out, you know, one hour on this day. Right. And if you don't take it, it's, it's going to your neighbor. It's going down the, it's going down the, uh, uh, the line to the next person. Yep. You know, the big question is, you know, we can talk about, you know, is it cheaper, you know, it costs the pump, you know, for pressurized irrigation, um, you know, without a doubt, you use less water, but if you don't have to pump it, you know, you are going to save that electricity. Um, again, I think with restrictions that are, you know, coming online, um, I think we're going to see less and less, you know, flood. We've already heard um, some rumblings from, you know, down in your neck of the woods, down in the Imperial uh, Valley area, where there's a lot of, a lot of flood. And, um, you know, we're already hearing that, you know, with the, some of the Colorado River um, situation going there and this tier two declaration that, you know, growers are looking at, um, you know, putting in pressurized irrigation systems. And I think for me, it's frustrating because the, the big question is, you know, why aren't there greater financial incentives, you know, to offset these less efficient, you know, low cost methods of irrigation? You're talking about some of the, the huge incentives when you look at it, you know, relatively or as a percent um, for taking out turf. And it's not that there aren't incentives. It's not that there aren't NRCS or sweep type programs that can help, you know, offset some of the cost. It's just not enough. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many growers will work with growers to get sweep grants and to get, you know, NRCS uh, money. And then the money runs out and, you know, you might have helped 30 growers and I've seen years where only three uh, got approved. And then you might have a, a big year where, you know, 15 um, or 20 out of the 30. But why not 30 out of the 30? You know, yeah. if these are these are valid projects that are going to increase the efficiency you know, of irrigation. Um, so that that's where I feel like, you know, we need um, a big push to uh, to do more there. We do, Jeff, um, and uh, this is another place where we're going to be in agreement. Um, so I mentioned the you know four bucks a square foot to take out the turf. Yeah. Now in a um, just in a big round number, and it, of course this depends on what you're growing and where you are. But I think for two grand an acre, you can put in a really nice drip system, um, plus or minus depending. Sure. But that that's a good just ballpark number. Now you get 170 thousand removed turf or two grand to put in drip. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, and then the other thing at which I see is the speed at which it happens. I can take a picture of my turf area. I can send in my plans with that picture. I can remove it, put in my drip, and I'll get a check in about uh, uh, four weeks. And uh, I think that is also the motivating factor because people are thinking, gee, I can pay for my renovation with my check. Yeah. And so these are real, I, and, and having similar incentives uh, is, are, are gonna drive the growers. But what I saw, right, this is the thing that bothers me about the, um, uh, the act that was passed this week, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, is that they want to use some of that money so that um, people will not grow this year and the money can uh, and the water can go downstream. They'll pay you not to grow this year and the money can go downstream where it can be used uh, for some somebody else. And I think, again, um, uh, sure, that's going to hit their goal of uh, conserving water. But I want the investment in the technology. We have the technology today to manage this water better, and we're not fully taking advantage of it. Totally agree. And I mean, it's um, again, it's 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 frustrating. I think you know, growers that I've talked to about these kind of programs in the past, farmers farm. You know, they don't. These guys want to work. You know, a lot of these family farms, you've got large corporate farms. Um, it's a business. It's it's a way of life. It's it's a lot of times it's multi generational. So to be you know paid not to farm, um, I don't know. It it just doesn't sit well uh, with with a lot of growers. And um, you know, and where where are we going to get to get the food from? Are we going to you know, become more reliant and dependent on, you know, countries outside of the U.S. I mean, we saw how that worked for us um, during the pandemic and with some of the supply chain issues. And if we can't get food on the table, um, you know, we're, we're, in, we're in hot water for sure. Right. 
Right. And, um, and, and yeah, using uh, less water in general is going to mean less food. Yep, definitely. Well, let's talk about a few more of the, um, of the solutions. So I try to break this down into some of the basic things and start, start simple. Um, this is, these are all low cost solutions that, that anyone can do. Uh, distribution uniformity testing is, it's easy. Uh, everyone can do it or have it done. Uh, DU is really how efficiently irrigation water is distributed, you know, throughout the field. When you think about it, a new system should be designed and installed and be somewhere around 92.92. Um, the average, the average that we've seen um, through the DU testing we've done for growers on our water management uh, services program is around 0.83. Uh, a lot of that probably is just degradation, you know, over time, you know, you get a new system that's installed and you get plugging, you know, some of them we see where uh, any growers out there will be nodding their heads, you know, you see where there's blue and yellow and red, um, you know, micro jets that are out there, you'll see if there's button emitters, you'll see different colors there. Um, you know, sometimes you have leaks and you cut out the leaks and you put in a different, um, you know, flow rate for the tubing, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and some of it is just, you know, maintenance and aging of the system itself. But when you think about it, you know, if you want to put one inch of water, just to kind of put this into perspective, if you want to put one inch of water on your field, you'll need to apply 1.11, so 1.11 inches if your DU was a 0.9 and that applied water goes to 1.25 inches to get the one inch at 0.8 DUs and all the way to 1.43 inches at a 0.7 DU. And that's almost a 30% difference um, just to get one inch across the entire field. And it's significant. I mean, and, and I, I will say from all the testing we've done, you know, we have averages in that 0.83 range, but certainly not all fields were, were at that 0.83. And um, I, I do think as systems are aging, uh, it is one of, uh, it's, it's low hanging fruit and it's something that we can, uh, we can all work on. Yeah, and Jeff, in the landscape uh, arena too, you know, uh, uh, with sprayhead irrigation, a 0.5 is fairly acceptable for most people, right? right? Half the water is being wasted. You need two inches to get the inch. Right, right. And yeah. so this is why I always say it's not what we're, it's not what we're watering is the issue. It's how we're watering. How we're watering. Totally, totally agree. And fixing leaks, you know, I've got a couple pictures here of, you know, when we were out doing some of the DU testing and, you know, we see leaks in, in every field. Uh, and I think growers, this is a challenge. I mean, growers, they work really hard. You know, the field workers are out there. Every time they start irrigation, most growers will have, you know, the guys run around the field on their quads or Kubotas or whatever it is that they're getting around the field in to look for leaks and try to fix them. But I can tell you, I've literally been in fields where one of those guys is riding around on a quad and I'm fixing, I've fixed seven leaks in one field while I was doing, you know, helping out on some DU testing. And the, the older gentleman that was riding around the quad, he never shut the quad off. I, I asked the grower, I said, Why, what's, you know, your guy, there's a lot of leaks here. Oh, he's riding around looking. I'm like, yeah, but he needs to turn that quad off unless he's going to run every single row. I could hear a leak when he wasn't running the quad next to me, you know, from three or four or five rows over. So, you know, sometimes it's just simple, I think, common sense things, but I think growers work hard on this, but it can be a significant source of, you know, loss of water. And it's something, you know, we should work on. And I know this has to be a challenge in, you know, the urban sector. Yeah, absolutely, it is. And uh, even from the water infrastructure standpoint, right, there was a Stanford study uh, last year that talked about um, 20 to as much as 50% of urban water loss to leaks from the, uh, from the municipal water system, right? Treated water leaking. And again, the challenge here is getting people to uh, pay more taxes to uh, to shore that up, right. but um, it's certainly, I mean, 
where it's, it's not dire, the technology is there, we can do these repairs, we can fix the problem. Right. And there are some legitimate fixes. We just might have to pay for it a little bit on the infrastructure side. The technology pays for itself in the ag side. Right. Totally. So, you know, last bullet on here is using local ETC or, you know, crop water consumption, you know, evapotranspiration. You know, we've done a lot of webinars on this, and I think, you know, most listeners should know what uh, ETC is. And there, there are there's free ETC data available. Um, it's generic. Um, it's typically, you know, on a county level, or if say you were using a seamless weather station, it would be the ET, uh, ETO at that weather station. And then you would apply, you know, whatever your KC factor for your crop is to get the ETC, um, you know, there. And this is kind of the bare minimum that, you know, we'd like to see people doing um, just to get where they're irrigating more on a replenishment basis. And, um, you know, we're trying so hard, and, and I hate to say this, but there are a lot of growers that still water, you know, the way they did, uh, they always did. And, you know, that's, well, that's what we hear. Well, why do you run 48 hours at a time? That's the way we always did it. And, you know, so technology can help on that, but using things um, that are simple and free uh, like your local ETC data to really get an idea of how much water you need to put back um, into the field is, is a good start. And I should say too, you should minimally um, be digging some holes to look to see how, you know, how much uh, soil moisture is and, and how that water is, is um, you know, traveling down into the root zone to make sure that uh, you're not over or even under irrigating in, in that standpoint. So let's talk about some advanced uh, solutions here. So on the advanced side of things, okay, so advanced means, you know, there's more technology involved, obviously more cost involved. I've got some samples up here, just some, some images from, you know, Gene Logic and some of the things we do um, at Gene. And uh, these technologies are out there and available, but at a minimum for the advanced side, I would say do in-field monitoring. And I would recommend doing minimally soil moisture. I would have a weather station, you know, in the field. I would have a flow meter that would be then connected to the system. So that data is recorded, you know, for you. And then, you know, we provide field specific satellite based ETC and vigor uh, images. So the difference being that instead of using a formula like ETO times KC, this ETC is calculated field specific on a pixel by pixel basis, you know, within the field. So it's it's the actual ET, um, the actual water consumption on the field, and it is definitely more accurate. Um, and I would put that into, you know, this advanced approach. Things like our infiltration chart, you know, you can see on some of the images up, up above, you know, the different data that's available that helps grower, growers irrigate more effectively um, you know this is this infiltration chart just as an example it, it really was a good one that I found that shows how far the water is going uh, into the soil so most of these you know the the green shaded area is the root zone so in this case it's about 18 down to about 48 inches and you can see the the wider blue bars that go all the way from the top to the bottom, the width of that represents the length of the irrigation event. So there's actually a pressure transducer or a pressure switch out there that's recording, you know, when the irrigation starts and when it stops. And then this is taking the data directly from the soil moisture probe and looking at the various depths as that water is um, percolating down through the, the soil. And we call this our infiltration chart. It's probably one of the most widely used charts um, to help growers land that water in the root zone and um, really, really an effective way of doing that. Hey, uh, Jeff, we have a question uh, or yeah. a comment coming in from one of our uh, viewers today, and they're asking, don't all farmers use this? Don't all growers use this technology? <laughs> I wish. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't know 
there aren't really any uh, industry statistics that are published. You know, I don't know. There have been some studies recently. And I think, you know, we may see some of that data that, that was looked at across the whole United States where, you know, on the questionnaires that the growers get, they're asking, you know, to use any form of technology, you know, they may say for soil moisture and other things. But, you know, a lot of that is, it could be very basic technology. Um, it's not something that is, you know, say cloud-based, it's gonna put this data in front of the grower on their cell phone, on their tablet, you know, laptop, whatever it is, you know, that they like to work from. And so I think, you know, if I was to venture to say, I, I, we're, we're less than 20%, you know, um, way less than 20%, I, I'm, I'm guessing 15 to 20% as far as the number of growers using technology across all fields. Yeah. We'll have some growers that'll have a system on one field, kind of maybe cheat a little and use it for their other two, three, four fields. Um, and I mean, it, it's better than not having any technology, but if you're going to be precise, be precise in every field. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's interesting. That shows we do have a long ways to go and this certainly can be a uh, solution. Part of, part of the solution. And uh, I know you guys are doing uh, water management services, uh, consulting services, right? Where you help the growers. And uh, one, of our, um, one of our viewers is asking the question, Jeff, is there an enrollment period? I mean, do, do I have to get in at a certain time or can I sign up for that at any time? Well, they're jumping right to the expert solutions. So it's good, good segue. Um, there's no enrollment period. You can sign up at any time um to to water management services it's obviously the benefits you know within the growing season it's better if you sign up i mean if you sign up now it's a year service it would carry you you know um through this winter um you know through the fall kind of kind of shut down putting putting the crops uh to sleep etc getting your irrigations in um through the winter months etc probably the most critical time is to be on this program before spring comes and, and, you know, in California here for, I would say orchard applications, you know, January timeframe, February timeframe, let's get out, let's get the technology installed. Let's do a good DU test. Um, and then you're going to benefit from not starting your irrigation until way past when all, you know, your neighbors are starting the irrigation, because we're going to help you really manage the water um, that's sitting in your soil, that bank of water that's sitting there. And we've had growers, we've helped growers push their first irrigation out I, I, at least two months, maybe, maybe even more than what they would have normally done in their normal operations. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful um, program. And I'm glad we, we got the question that, uh, that got us over here. Yeah, you guys are doing a great job with it too. And, you know, I thought it was super that uh, your first year you won the uh, Irrigation Association's new product uh, contest award for consulting services. I think everybody is recognizing that uh, people may need some help at the beginning with the technology. So getting a coach in there that's going to help me understand what I'm looking at and how to look at it and the process. I, it's just fantastic what you guys Absolutely. are doing. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that, you know, and the feedback I got from the IA was that uh, that that really helped push us over the edge to win was the fact that we were doing DU tests. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, will will try to um, help you, um, you know, with their technology. But when we stepped back and looked at this, we really felt like the starting point is to make sure that the irrigation system is performing um, at least at a 0.85 um, DU. I mean, anything really, anything less than that. And, and frankly, they would be better to spend the money that they would pay us. I could give you the best schedule in the world, but if you're gonna have to run, you know, 10, 15, 20% longer, 30, 40% longer to get the water out on the field, you're gonna lose all of those savings and benefits. So. Um, you know, I think that was a big part of, of what we're doing there. You know, the other thing that I would recommend on the expert side of things is automation. 
Mm. We're seeing a lot more activity um, for automation with growers today. I, it, it feels like for the most part, that is being driven by the increased labor costs. So it's a great way to, to reduce labor costs. So you know, if you can remotely and automatically schedule your irrigation and the pump will come on and the valves will open, the valves will close, you know, the pumps will turn off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can start and stop fertigation. And, um, you know, we, we've gotten really good at this. You not only save, you not only save from a labor standpoint, you're, you're going to save um, quite a bit on the uh, uh, water side. We see it all the time. And, um, you know, I don't want to get in anybody in trouble, but we've got, we've seen growers where, um, there are significant variations in run times for the various sets. And we see it all the time because the person that's going to go change that water is going to go switch the valve. They got distracted, um, and distracted could be, they were fixing leaks. They got called to the other side of the ranch or their girlfriend called. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, when a set was supposed to run 10 hours, you know, and it ends up running 13 or 14 and the next set gets shorted, um, you know, it's, it's not good. Uh, it, it's definitely not an optimal way to, to irrigate. So with automation, you can be much more precise, um, save water and save on labor. Yeah, it's a byproduct of being too busy, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a byproduct of the labor shortage. I'm doing 20 different things. Of course, I forgot to turn it on or turn it off. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Richard, that's, uh, that's what I had for today, as far as, you know, some of the things that we feel um, could really help growers. I tried to keep it fairly simple and, and on things that are available today, you know, and things that we can all do, um, things that are, are cost effective, um, you know, all the way up to say, you know, water management uh, services or, or automation, which is, is totally cost effective as well. Yeah, I totally think you hit your mark today, Jeff. Uh, it is, uh, we're in a dire situation, but it's not so dire that we don't have solutions. Right. And uh, the solutions exist today. I think you made that point really well to make a big dent in, uh, in our water woes. And, uh, and, and, you know, as, as, the, uh, as we say at Jane, you know, more, more crop per drop, right? We really Absolutely. need to grow more using the same or less water, but the technology exists to do that. We've got some other big areas that we can look at, flood irrigation, leaks in urban areas. Uh, these things can be fixed and repaired. Uh, so it's not as dire as it might seem. Uh, the, these solutions are, are available. And, you know, that, that keeps me hopeful. So thank you for coming on and uh, sharing these ideas with us today. Absolutely. And um, we'll keep uh, pushing everybody to technology yep. so that we can, um, we can all contribute to uh, uh, saving some water. You know, Richard, I did want to say one thing, and that is any of the subjects that I talked about today on the technology side, and you can, you know, certainly pitch this, we have a whole library of webinars, you know, on each one of these individual subjects. And you can dive as deeply in, into these if you want to learn more or, or by all means, feel free to call me or, or any of my, you know, staff and we'd love to help you. Yeah, that's great, Jeff. We appreciate that. Yeah, almost uh, 200 trainings now in our training library at janesusa.com forward slash trainings. Or we're also wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, you can find us there too. And it's always one of my favorite things to, to know people are out there working and improving uh, their water management skills at the same time. So again, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks uh, to our viewers. We really appreciate you spending some of your time, uh, your, 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 some of your day with us. Yes. Uh, it's, it's tight for everybody. So we really appreciate that. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll be back here on Wednesday to talk to uh, Michael Pippen about uh, all the choices you have for emitters in greenhouse and nursery irrigation. Should be a fun one. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Richard.